It's lovely to be back in this part of the world. I trained for ministry in Oxford. I did my postgraduate, postdoctoral work in Oxford. And I did a placement when I was at Wycliffe Hall training uh, in Stanford in the Vale, part of the same deanery. So this is a, a, it's lovely to be back here with you. Okay, so God or the Big Bang. Well, I hope that everyone recognizes the person in the, at the right in this uh, picture. It is, of course, Albert Einstein. The person on the left is probably much less familiar. Uh, his name is Georges Lemaitre. He's actually the father of the Big Bang Theory. And you can see that he was a priest. He was a Catholic priest. And indeed, of course, I look like this sometimes on Sundays if I'm officiating. I, because I'm sort of in more secular employment, I tend not to most the rest of the week. But uh, although he, it just has to be said, wore it all the time. There, you know, whether it, we, there are pictures of him with a blackboard with lots of equations and so on, and still wearing his clerical collar. Now, um, so, well, hang on then. God or the Big Bang? Well, I think we've settled that with the first picture. <laughs> this was one of the greatest cosmologists um, of the 20th century, if not of all time. What he did was solve Einstein's equations of general relativity, that's Einstein's theory of gravity, applied to the universe as a whole, and in 1927, uh, he got an expanding universe solution. The universe is expanding. Uh, then in um, 1931, in fact, the expansion was observed just a couple of years later by someone called Edwin Hubble in the US. Then in 1931, Lemaitre got a further solution in which this expansion was from uh, what he called the primordial atom, um, the primeval atom, uh, from a very compact initial state. Uh, he called it the prime, primeval atom. Um, it was dubbed Big Bang a few years later by a Cambridge astrophysicist called Fred Hoyle, who actually hated the idea. Um, uh, and Hoyle, uh, who was incidentally an atheist, said, oh, well, we can explain the expansion in another way. He had a theory called the steady state, whereby the expansion of the universe, in which galaxies are being pulled apart by the expanding space, um, can be explained if instead of a Big Bang, you have new matter coming into the space between the galaxies as they move apart at just the right rate, something like one atom in the size of St. Paul's Cathedral every 100 years or something, far below any measurable threshold. But if you did have that, then the universe would be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, Christians here would probably recognize that phrase and apply it to something or someone else. Anyway, uh, the Big Bang won the day. It's extremely well supported by evidence, and in, of course the expansion, despite uh, uh, Hoyle, but further evidence. And the clinching evidence came in 1965 with the observation of cosmic background radiation. There were astronomers in America who argued that if the universe started in this very compact state, it would have been very hot, and as it expanded, the universe would cool down, and it would leave behind this remnant radiation. That, that prediction was made in 1948, and they predicted a temperature of something like five degrees above absolute zero. Absolute zero is minus 273 Celsius, pretty cold. But then in 1965, these characters, Penzias and Wilson, um, observed, they detected the remnant radiation from the Big Bang. Um, they thought they'd got bird droppings in their antenna. What they'd actually got was the remnant radiation from the origin of the universe at the Big Bang, which had to be explained to them by cosmologists. Uh, but in the, in the event, they got the Nobel Prize for it. Um, <laughs> and there's a nice story about uh, Lemaitre. Uh, he died in 1965 and heard about this clinching evidence for his theory on his deathbed, just within days of his, of his death, which we 
celebrated just recently. Um, okay, well, we have the Big Bang Theory then, and I just want to give you a flavor of what we're talking about in cosmology today. This is a typical galaxy containing something like 100 billion stars. Of course, we can't, it obviously can't be our galaxy because we're inside our galaxy, but um, if it were, then our star would be an ordinary one just somewhere out on the, on, on the edge of a spiral, one of the spiral arms. This may look like a lot of blobs to you, but each blob in this picture is a galaxy. This is taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's the Hubble Deep Field and Ultra Deep Field. And these galaxies in this picture were formed when the universe was 5% of its present age of 13.8 billion years. Uh, a truly stunning picture. Now, the way things go is that as the uh, universe expands, it, it's basically just made of hydrogen, one or two other trace elements, you get instabilities. And under gravitation, these instabilities form galaxies and within the galaxies, stars. Inside the stars, the chemical elements of which you and I and our planet are made are built up through nuclear reactions. <laughs> And when the heaviest of these stars have come to the end of burning their nuclear fuel, they explode as supernovae. Uh, and they spread out the material that they've made um, so that the new generations of stars can have planets and maybe ultimately life. Now, this is a particularly fine example, the Crab Nebula, which was observed by Chinese astronomers in the year 1054, but in this very beautiful photograph, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope again. This is another example of a similar sort of thing where the star at the center has sent out a <coughs> come to the end of its life, sent out a gigantic shock wave and lit up the surrounding gas within this uh, necklace type pattern. Now, it seems to me that the Big Bang uh, throws up maybe two main questions which are potentially, at any rate, relate to theology. One of, is that, well, it looks as though the universe began to exist 13.8 billion years ago. And the second is that the universe is apparently fine-tuned for life. It needed to be set up in a particular way uh, in order for life to arise within it. So let's look at these questions. Uh, first of all, what do we make of the beginning? This is St. Augustine. So uh, it's not as if these questions haven't been thought about before in uh, Christian theology. Augustine had this to say, assuredly the world was made not in time but simultaneously with time. He says that space and time and matter all came into existence together at the beginning when God created the universe. Now, that is very close to what uh, the Big Bang Theory is actually saying today. Of course, Augustine couldn't have known anything about the Big Bang Theory. But the idea that space and matter and time are all intimately bound together in Einstein's general relativity. Um, and so they came into existence together 13.8 billion years ago. Now, uh, now we know. Now, that has troubled some cosmologists. I've already mentioned uh, Fred Hoyle, but it troubles uh, Stephen Hawking. And Stephen Hawking has come up with a very ingenious, very, very clever theory, um, something he calls the no boundary proposal, uh, which apparently does away with the beginning. And he says this, so long as the universe had a beginning, we could suppose that it had a creator. But if the universe is really completely self-contained, having no boundary or edge, it would have neither beginning nor end. It would simply be what place then for a creator. 
That's back in a brief history of time. And he says the same sort of thing in his uh, more recent book, The Grand Design. Now, there are several misunderstandings here, particularly about theology. Uh, he seems to think that the only role for God in the universe is to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going, as it were. But uh, that is certainly not what Christian theologians think. Uh, the universe depends on God for every second of it, every tiny, tiniest fraction of a second of its existence. But then what about the, uh, the, his proposal? Well, there are serious scientific and philosophical problems with this no-boundary proposal. What he's saying is that as you track back the history of the universe in time, time itself becomes imaginary. Now, those of you who've got maths or physics backgrounds will know what's meant by that, by that term imaginary in this context. It's to do with imaginary numbers, square root of minus one and so on. Uh, the other way of looking at it is, is that time becomes like a space dimension. So instead of having three dimensions of, uh, of space and one of time as we normally th think we have, we have at the beginning four dimensions of space. Now that has serious problems because time, real time, is what measures change of state from one state to another. If you only have space, then how does anything change? The universe might just be, as uh, Hawking puts it, might simply be, but how could it be anything other than it was? And indeed, um, actually in his technical papers, rather than, his than in his popular writings, Hawking does talk about the universe having a beginning in time. Uh, it actually begins at the point at the surface where this four-dimensional space and the three-dimensional space and one of time intersect. It has a beginning at a, at a very small but finite radius. Add into this what this colleague of Hawking's, um, this cosmologist Alexander Vilenkin, has said. Back in 2010, there was a symposium in Cambridge to celebrate Stephen Hawking's uh, yeah, 70th birthday. Given his illness, of course, it's, it's truly, it was 2012. No, he's 70, yeah, we just celebrated last year his 75th. But yeah, even so, I'm getting slightly confused about his age. Um, but even so, given this terrible affliction that Hawking has had, uh, which he's had since age 21, it's truly, truly astonishing that he should still be with us to this day and still doing cosmology, still going into the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics every day in Cambridge and, 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 and doing his stuff. It's, it's extraordinary. But anyway, because it may, at this symposium, uh, Hawking sadly couldn't be there because of one of his periodical bouts of illness where he has to go into hospital, but he sent a message to the symposium saying that if the universe had a beginning, then it would need God to create it. Um, and uh, this man, Vilenkin, has proved certain so-called singularity theorems, tracking back the history of the universe with various, all the models of um, cosmology that are on offer today, including multiverse models that I'll talk about a, a bit later. And uh, he says that these singularity theorems basically point to all these models having a, a beginning in time. All the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning, is what he says. Um, now, having said that, um, I've, I've mentioned the theological objection to this view of Hawking. It, in one sense, it doesn't really matter for, a the, for theology whether the universe has a beginning in time or not, because it needs God to create it. St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century said, by faith alone do we hold and by no demonstration can it be proved that the world did not always exist. However, it still needs God to create it. Whether it has a finite sequence of, or, or, or a finite history going back to a beginning or an infinite history going infinitely far back in time, it's still dependent on God for its existence, moment by moment, and it needs God to create it. Now, 
there are some other, sort of other theories out there, and in fact, Hawking supports this as well as the man I'm going to talk about now, Lawrence Krauss, who wrote A Universe from Nothing. Krauss thinks that the universe can create itself out of nothing. It's, if you're struggling to get your head around that and you think that's a bit paradoxical, you'd be right. Uh, what Krauss has actually done is redefine something called the quantum vacuum as nothing. Now, in quantum theory, which is the physical theory applying to the very small, um, the vacuum is not nothing. It's actually a hive of activity in which... Uh, Particles come into existence, annihilate, and so on, uh, in, in an absolute split second. Now, maybe the universe could have started from a quantum vacuum. You get some kind of runaway effect. Uh, rather than annihilating, you get, uh, you, you get um, uh, matter that's created, sort of continuing in existence. Well, that might, that might be a, a, a way it all got started. But it is not creation out of nothing. Um, the universe creating itself. And I, th I think there is uh, um, something going wrong here with the physicists who say this, like Krauss and like Hawking too, which is rather parallels what's going on in this story from Through the Looking Glass. Now, here is um, Alice. And there's a very confused conversation happening here. I see nobody on the road, said Alice. I only wish I had such eyes, the king remarked in a fretful tone, to be able to see nobody, and at that distance too. <laughs> Who did you pass on the road? The king went on, holding out his hand to the messenger. Nobody, said the messenger. Quite right, said the king. This young lady saw him too. So, of course, nobody walks slower than you. I do my best, the messenger said in a sullen tone. I'm sure nobody walks much faster than I do. Oh, he can't do that, said the king, or else he'd have been here first. <laughs> well, you see what's going on here is, is, is uh, in fact, I, I didn't put it up for you, but there you've got the whole, the, whole, the, the whole quotation. So you've got a confusion between a nobody as a Mr. Nobody, a person, a real person called nobody, and nobody in the sense of no person at all. So I think... That's the kind of confusion that's going on with nothing. Nothing as, in the philosophical terms, would be the absence of anything at all, and nothing as redefined as a, a rather sophisticated something, a quantum vacuum. OK, well, let's, uh, let's move on from that slightly. Um, now, the basic question is, why is there a universe at all? Why is there something rather than nothing? That's the ultimate philosophical question, requiring an ultimate explanation. Now, here again is St. Thomas Aquinas, and he uh, said that only God can provide the explanation because God is necessary. Now, that's a philosophical term. I'm going to introduce it's opposite in a moment. But what necessary means is cannot not exist, must exist. There never was when God was not. Um, God is eternal and so on. You can argue about whether a necessary being exists. But if this necessary being exists, then that necessary being, God, explains why everything else exists. Because everything else, the universe, is what philosophers call contingent. It may or may not have been. It could have been different from what it was. And, um, and that's how philosophers generally see the universe. And indeed, interestingly enough, that's precisely how Hawking saw the universe when he wrote A Brief, brief History of Time. He asked this very fascinating, interesting question. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? Rather like Pilate asking what is truth and not staying for an answer. Um, you, could, you see, you can have the most sophisticated, wonderful theory, but why is there a universe that that theory applies to? It might be this thing called M-theory, string theory, that I'll, I'll come back to 
just in a moment, uh, favored by Hawking. But why is there a universe which that theory describes? Well, science can't explain that. Um, but uh, God, theology, can. Now, OK, now, now on to the, the, the second big question. And that is the specialness of the universe, the so-called fine-tuning of the universe. And that relates to two things. It, it relates to the way the universe was set up at the beginning, the initial conditions back there at 13.8 billion years ago, and it relates to the physical constants. Now, these describe the various strengths of the fundamental forces of nature. Gravity, forces that hold an atom together, uh, and, and so on and the masses of the fundamental particles of physics. And th there are some examples of this so-called fine-tuning. So one second after the origin of, at the, of the Big Bang, the mean density of stuff of matter energy in the universe needed to be what it was to within one part in 10 to the power 15. That's one with 15 noughts after it. The universe is sitting on a knife edge between expanding forever and ultimately recontracting. And it needs to be very, very close to that knife edge, which is determined by the mean density, in order for it to give rise to stars and planets and life. If the universe is slightly under dense by more than this amount, then the universe will expand far too quickly for anything interesting to happen, for, for these gravitational instabilities to happen to form galaxies and stars and planets. If the universe is slightly over-dense, slightly denser than it is, then the universe re recontract far, far too quickly for anything interesting to happen. It's absolutely finely, finely balanced. Here's another one. Uh, the weak nuclear force is the force responsible for radioactive decay. Well, it and the gravitational force need to be very, very finely balanced, related in a very particular way in order for uh, a universe to have hydrogen in it. At the Big Bang, in the first few minutes of the Big Bang, 25, you, you, all you've got is hydrogen to begin with, but 25% of it gets converted into helium. Actually, that gets solves a mystery. Um, people like Fred Hoyle and others who are working on the nuclear fusion in stars thought that all the elements were built up by nuclear fusion in, in stars, but they couldn't account for the amount of helium in the universe. The Big Bang does account for that. It's another piece of evidence in its favor. But if this, these forces were slightly out of, out of balance by a tiny, tiny amount, then all the hydrogen would be converted to helium then you'd have a universe with no possibility of water in it, fundamental for life. Now, this is an interesting one, too, the strength of gravity. Now, um, it could be stronger than it is. It could be maybe up to 3,000 times the value it is. Now, if it were anything like that on this planet, uh, well, our bodies would just be crushed um, to, 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 to pulp in no time. But where well, you can compensate for that by getting smaller and smaller planets. But then you reach a limit. You can't support an ecosystem on a tiny planet. Um, so, so there is a limit to the value that the gravitational constant, the force of gravitation, can take. But in principle, it could be a lot larger still. It could be anything up to 10 to the power. Uh, 40 times its actual value, one with 40 noughts after it. And if you just do a simple sum here, you'll find that suppose the universe were randomly selected from all possible universes with, um, with gravity, um, taking random values, then the, um, the probability that it's just right is 3,000 divided by 10 to the 40, which is 3 times 10 to the minus 37, 3 divided by 1 with 37 noughts after it, 
tiny, tiny, tiny probability that it's good enough for life. <laughs> then, this is in many ways the most interesting. The strong nuclear force is the force that binds atomic nuclei together. And it has to be just right in order for carbon and oxygen to be manufactured in the universe. And it's rather interesting that this particular coincidence was discovered by none other than our friend Fred Hoyle, the Cambridge atheist cosmologist. You make, um, you make carbon by crashing helium nuclei together, three of them, and making them stick. And it's very, very difficult because two helium nuclei crashed together is beryllium and it's unstable. It only lasts for a fleeting, fleeting fraction of a second. So you need some enhanced effect to hold that threesome together, to get a, th a third one coming along and, and, and sticking. And Hoyle made a prediction when he did the calculations that there would be an energy level called a resonance in the carbon atom at just this particular value. Uh, nobody knew that there, there didn't seem to be one from nuclear tables. He sent the details of his calculations to colleagues in America who discovered this particular energy level in the carbon atom. His colleagues, here's another story, they got the Nobel Prize for it, but he missed out on having made the discovery. There's a, a lovely letter, actually, from William Fowler to Hoyle in St. John's College Library in Cambridge, uh, where Fowler is deeply apologetic, as it were, um, saying, Hoyle, you sh Fred, you should have shared in this prize, but I, you know, I, what can I, I have to accept it for my own institution and so on, but... Yeah, it was unjust. You should, have, you should have shared it. Anyway, be as it may. When he made the discovery, he said this, a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology, and there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. You actually need a further effect. In order to make oxygen, you need to make a fourth helium nucleus stick onto, this, um, onto the carbon atom now. Um, but, of course, you don't need to, to turn all your carbon into oxygen because then you've lost it. You've got no carbon, and that's the element you need for life. So it's, it's an extremely, the, the constants of physics just have to be extremely fine-tuned for this to work. Um, and that was what he thought. He, he thought the universe was a put-up job. This is a man who, um, uh, on the BBC in the 40s, early, late 40s and early 50s, described religion as an illusion. Um, I was in Belfast a couple of years ago, and I, I sort of took my life in my hands, as it were, by um, describing what Hoyle's solution was for the Northern Ireland problem, which was to lock up all the Catholic priests and all the Protestant ministers and throw away the key because they were teaching, teaching nonsense to their congregations and different nonsense. <laughs> well, you know, um, <laughs> anyway... But he was moved to talk about super intellect, a super intellect behind the universe, behind the laws of physics. Couldn't quite bring himself to, to, to use the word God. But I mean, what are we talking about here? Um, okay. Right. Now, here, here is uh, Paul Davis, a well-known cosmologist who thinks there's really something going on here that needs explaining. Like the porridge and the tail of Goldilocks and the three bears, the universe seems to be just right for life in so many intriguing ways, he says. Uh, I must press on. Okay, so why is the universe so special? Why is it set up in such a special way? Well, if you're a believer, it's not too much of a problem. You think, well, God had purposes and intentions that the universe would bring about life in it at some point in its history. And what are your alternatives if you don't take that view? Well, there are two main ones. Uh, the first, probably not so popular, uh, but anyway, is to say, well, maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm just wrong here. Maybe uh, the constants have to take the values they do in order to make a self-consistent theory or something. Maybe we'll get a theory where we calculate what all the constants just have to be. Um, a so-called theory of everything. Maybe only one set of constants is possible for our set of laws. Maybe even stronger than that, maybe only one set of laws is possible. The alternative to that is the diametric opposite. It's so, yeah, it's all possible. Or you can have uh, lots of different 
constants, uh, values of the constants, in fact, you do have all of them. Maybe you have it all, even all possible physical laws in some universe or other, some actually existing universe. Then you're supposed to say, oh, well, um, we, just happen to be in, we just happen to be in a universe where everything's turned out right. All the universes with all the constants exist, but uh, you know, no need to invoke God, apparently, on that view. So it is said. However, um, now, there, of course, there, I've just said there are two versions of the first one of these. You might have our set of laws and lo all the values of the constants instantiated in different universes, but then you'd still have to ask yourself um, why this particular set of laws. If you go beyond that, and then really this is the only way to solve the problem, if, if you're an atheist, is to say, well, every, every possible universe with every possible set of laws and its constants has to be instantiated. Then you've covered all the bases. Um, but then you are left with a deep, deep puzzle, it seems to me. Why does the only set of possible set of laws give rise to life? We can imagine lots of other universes. We can imagine a universe that just has maybe a few uh, fundamental particles floating around in otherwise empty space. What's incoherent or inconsistent about that? <coughs> and for the atheistic strategy, the second one, uh, all possible universes exist. Well, there are problems there, because you can choose between multiverses, co giant collections of universes. Even if there are infinitely many, you can choose between them. Can, there are different ways of choosing infinity, uh, infinitely numbers of things. Um, and, and, and why does... And you can always add to, a, add to a multiverse. You can never exhaust an infinity. You can always add to it. So you can never exhaust the, the, the possible space. Now, let's go to some recent developments in cosmology. Now, this is a man, and in fact, you'll see how in cosmology these different kinds of explanations have rather alternated. This is a man called Alan Guth, who came up with a theory called inflation, uh, which um, postulates that in the first tiniest fraction of a second, the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds from the beginning of the universe, one divide with one with, divided by one with 32 noughts after it, that tiny fraction of a second, the universe underwent an incredibly fast rate of expansion. So in this diagram, what's happening here is, here you've got the first 10 to the minus, you've got time across here, first 10 to the minus 32 seconds here, and the universe this is space dimension, it increases in size gigantically. And then you get the slower normal expansion of the Big Bang, which now just seems to be speeding up again. Um, now, what this actually does, if this happens, is it drives some of the parameters to the right value. Um, in particular, that mean density that I was talking about is driven to some very close to the critical value. Um, However, um, so that's, that's what I mean by that statement. However, it turns out that inflation itself needs fine-tuning. So what you've done, and this is a sort of pattern, you've shifted the question up a level. Why is inflation the theory that applies? And then why, indeed, does the universe expand for just the, uh, inflate for just the right length of time uh, and do just, just, you know, just delivers the perfect universe in the end. So what people have done now is gone to these theories of chaotic and eternal inflation, which are multiverse versus versions of inflation. Now, generally by a multiverse, we mean uh, an infinite space in which there are different island regions, if you like, which individually get called universes. There are, there are, lots, there are lots of different variants on this, but that's what's meant here. So there are regions of space which inflate at different rates. Um, some don't inflate at all, uh, and so on. Uh, and it's, this is meant to deliver um, um, enough universes so as to have at least one, maybe more, well, probably infinitely many, um, that are just right for life. 
As soon as you get into the realm of infinity, everything gets multiplied up by infinity. That's, well, well, maybe the problem. Now, here's a man called Leonard Susskind, who is a pioneer of string theory. You don't need to know anything apart from the fact, well, I'll just briefly say, this is a theory of the very small, really. Um, of It's basically saying that funda fundamental particles aren't points anymore. They're little tiny strings, very, 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 very tiny. And the way the strings vibrate gives you the different um, fundamental particles, electrons, protons, and so on, or quarks, or what have you. Um, now, um, the problem with this theory, which, now, which has now been around for sort of maybe half a, you know, half a century, 40 years or more, um, has made no predictions. Um, it's, it was meant to be a theory of everything which did predict everything, uh, the, the masses of the particles and so on. It's not done it. And Suskind now sees that as a strength. And he says, well, actually, what we need to do is to move to something he calls the landscape, which is a multiverse version of string theory, with maybe 10 to the power 500 different solutions, which all are instantiated in different universes. So this is a multiverse version of string theory. Now, this is uh, highly speculative. Um, and there are a number of very and the Big Bang theory, as I've mentioned, is pretty well established. The, big, the basic paradigm of the Big Bang is very well established. But when people talk about the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds, the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds for string theory, then you are in the realm of speculation. And this is a physicist called Lev Landau, a Russian physicist, who has said this about cosmology. Cosmologists are often in error, but seldom in doubt. <laughs> which is a rather entertaining view on them. Um, there's a lot of good stuff going on, but um, particularly at the observational level. But there is a lot of at the, uh, of the uh, very sophisticated mathematics, but uh, highly speculative. So let me now move on to um, a little bit about the problems for multiverses. Well, first, there is this business that it's highly speculative. <clears throat> You wouldn't, I mean, the, the, the Large Hadron Collider you've probably heard about at CERN mimics conditions in the very early universe. When the Higgs boson, you're talking about the universe when it was a trillionth of a second old, to the, 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 when that particle existed. Um, but even that, you know, that's, that's a long, long way from 10 to the minus 32 or 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Uh, and you'd need an accelerator to mimic the energies involved at, the, the, at that particular time. You'd need an accelerator the size of the galaxy. So you, you're, you're in trouble. Um, there's a problem about infinities um, when you get to infinitely many things. Um, well, for example, here, uh, here are infinitely many numbers. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13 etc., etc. But that sequence does not have the property, no member of that sequence has the property of evenness. So the fact that you've got infinitely many universes doesn't guarantee that you have universes that are right for life. And there's a problem about human identity. As I said, as soon as we enter this realm, I mean, the probability of there be of, of of any particular universe being fine-tuned for life is infinitesimally small, tiny, tiny, tiny. Might even be literally probability zero. But anyway, be this as it may, when you start to multiply up by infinity, the numbers of universes that are right for life then also multiplies up uh, to be infinite, as long as it's got a finite rather than actual zero probability to begin with. So what that means is that somewhere in some distant galaxy in some universe way, way, way beyond anything we could observe, but there is a, a copy of this room with another lecture going on it, something like this, but in which you know, actually the speaker doesn't actually turn up. He thinks he'll put his feet up and watch television tonight back in Cambridge. Or 
maybe he drops down. I hope we're not in the universe in which he drops down dead halfway through, but be as it may. Um, you know, you'll get copies of everything that's happening. It's bizarre. It doesn't defeat the idea necessarily, but it's, you know, if you can, get, if, if you, if you can avoid paradoxical seeming situations like that, maybe it's better. And for, for this sort of reason, it doesn't seem like a simple hypothesis. And when you have competing hypotheses to explain the data in science, normally what you do is you opt for the one that's the simplest. This violates something known as Occam's razor, the principle that you choose a, a theory with the fewest number of entities to do the trick. William of Ockham in the 14th century talked about not multiplying entities needlessly. There's a lack of predictability because as soon as you enter this realm again of infinity, you get into the realm where universes can be chaotic. They can be very highly ordered up to a particular point, and then they can become chaotic. And of course, they could become chaotic at any particular moment in time. And of course, the number of ways they can become chaotic far outnumbers the ways they can continue being wholly ordered and structured. Uh, and, 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 and we might get some very strange feature in our laboratory that, uh, well, we'd normally think about explaining through science, maybe through modifying our theory or whatever. But if you're in a multiverse, well, that's, you know, you can say, well, that'll happen somewhere in some universe. You know, let's not worry. There's something called the cosmological constant, which I don't want to, well, um, yeah, that's, the, that's what's causing, when you, you remember I s showed that picture of inflation and the universe is accelerating now. Um, well, that's due to this thing called the cosmological constant, which Einstein put in his equations, but later thought was his biggest blunder. And for a long time we thought it was zero, but it does now seem to be very small. What it is, is a negative force, uh, like uh, an anti-gravity, that is making the universe now accelerate. And physicists think they know what it is. The trouble is that when they calculate what they think it is, the energy of the quantum vacuum, something called dark energy, if any of you read about this stuff, they get a value that's a factor of 10 to the power 120 times too big. And if it were anything like that value, well, we couldn't exist in the first place, but if it suddenly became that value, our bodies would fly apart to opposite sides of the universe in a split second. Um, it's one of the biggest mismatches between theory and experiment, um, theory and, uh, uh, and observation. It's highly, highly finely tuned. <coughs> now, fine tuning is still required to get some of the multiverse models. To get an infinite universe in the first place with these island universes is, requires the mean overall density of the whole thing to be less than that critical value I talked about, so that it can be infinite in extent. Otherwise, it's a, it would be a finite universe, finite, and you wouldn't have, you know, you'd never get to infinity. It's on the edge, as I was saying, we don't, we, we, we don't know. But it would need to be fine-tuned. The mean density would have to be less than, you know, confined to a narrow region, less than the critical value. Then there's the amount of order in the universe. <clears throat> and um, the Cosmologist Roger Penrose in Oxford has calculated that the creator, and of course cosmologists use this term often metaphorically, but Penrose calculates that the creator had of the order of 10 to the power, 10 to the power, 123 universe configurations to choose from, only one of which resembles ours, is ordered and structured as ours is. That's a tiny, tiny probability, if you like, of the universe starting off right. And the universe needs to start off highly ordered because of what <coughs> physicists call the second law of thermodynamics. It's going from a state of order to a state of disorder. So um, I don't have a glass of water here, but if I did and I knocked it off the table and the glass smashed, uh, well, that's how things are. Um, uh, that's how the universe goes. What you don't see is shards of glass coming together, filling up with water, and jumping back onto tables. You might see that if the film's being run backwards, or if it's Harry Potter or something, but not in the real world. So you need to be ordered to start with to be able to 
get the order and structure that we have. And the even more interesting thing is, OK, explain this by a multiverse. There are 10 to the 10 to 123 at least universes. You'll have one that's this ordered. And that's when we get to the fact that, well, actually, you don't need quite that much order to have life. A universe just with a single solar system would be enough, surrounded by a sort of chaos, re region of chaos. And you can do that with a much less probability. So the analogy for what I'm talking about here is your monkey sitting at a typewriter for eons and eons on end eventually comes up with to be or not to be, that is the question. Suppose that's a universe with life in. It'll eventually get there. But it's not the universe we're in. We're in a universe that's more like the complete works of Shakespeare, that ordered and structured in comparison. And that will be extremely, extremely, extremely rare. The probability that we would be in it as intelligent observers is tiny. I won't go into fake universes unless anyone wants to tell me, but the, the theistic explanation, the idea that God did it, provides the ultimate explanation, why there's a universe at all. It explains why there should be life, because God had purposes and intentions for the universe, that it should do that. Um, God freely chose to create this particular universe, intending that it produce intelligent creatures, and is more likely to produce a universe that, <clears throat> that is as ordered and structured as far as we can see, rather than the single solar system. And so God explains why the universe is so special. And here, going back to the original question, God or Big Bang, here's my friend George Lemaitre again, who said this. There were two ways of arriving at the truth. I decided to follow them both. And I rather identify with this. Science and theology, God and the Big Bang. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you very much to everybody who's provided uh, refreshments for us, and we've got a good set of questions, so thank you very much for writing those as well. Let's make a start. Let's, let's go back in time and go back even before the Big Bang. That's quite a long way back. What could have existed before the Big Bang? If the Big Bang happened, then what was there one second before the Big Bang? Those are similar, and, and what could have triggered it? Right, that's um, a good question. Um, the theory as it stands, the standard Big Bang theory, traces the history of the universe back literally to a point to what um, Vilenkin, who was picture I put up there, would call a singularity. And that's a point beyond which you cannot go. Um, it's a point where science, where physics runs out, if you like. Um, so we have all these competing theories for what happens in that first tiny, tiny fraction of a second, but we can't actually reach the Big Bang. Now, there have been theories about oscillating universes. Um, and indeed, Georges Lemaitre thought this was a possibility. Um, the Pope um, came when the, in the early 50s came up with a very strong statement about how um, the Big Bang, you know, science had now proved the existence of God. Uh, fiat looks, science says so now. The Big Bang traces you, Genesis, you know, traces you back to the beginning. Uh, and Lemaitre thought that was certainly very premature. And it was a bit confusing the science and the theology too. But it was certainly premature at that particular time when um, there were other options, the steady state. Um, and indeed, the oscillating universe is a possibility. So you have an, uh, an expanding universe which eventually contracts, expands again, and so on. Um, there are lots of problems with that, though. Uh, and one is the second law of thermodynamics, which I talked about. So Roger Penrose, who I mentioned, who talked about the amount of order in the universe, that 10 to the 10 to the 123 business, he said, well, that there's an asymmetry between the beginning and the end of a cycle. Uh, at the end of our cycle, the universe will end up totally chaotic. It starts highly ordered, it ends up chaotic. And so in a sequence of universes, there is only the smallest 
fraction of those universes that would be ordered and structured enough for life. And that particular model, too, depends on, um, uh, on, the, on the universe being finite. You know, that the, that's when you get the expanding and the contracting. So, yeah, I mean, on current views, the universe actually began um, 13.8 billion years ago. But what is it expanding into, ah, is no, the question. Yes, 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 here we are. Yes. As the bubble is expanding, <laughs> what is outside the bubble? Uh, and, and the answer is, there's nothing outside the bubble. Um, if the universe is infinite, you don't seem to have quite the pr conceptual problem, I don't think. In that, But what's expanding is space. It's space pulling apart the galaxies. Now, according to Einstein's general theory of relativity, space can be positively or negatively curved or flat in the jargon. Now, um, if space is positively curved, then it will it'll be one of these recontracting spaces. It won't have a boundary or edge. Um, it will be finite in size, but it won't have a boundary or edge. If, as, uh, if, you, if you go off in your space rocket, then you won't hit a boundary. Um, now, it's just possible that our universe could be finite. It would be big, um, uh, but in cosmological terms, if it's smaller than about 50, 40 or 50 billion light years in dimension, then we could possibly detect that we're in a finite universe. Because we could be looking at different parts of the sky, which are the same object. So light is doing a very kind of funny thing and bending around so that it comes to us from two directions. Um, and that would be a, a finite universe. And a finite universe in that three-dimensional sense would be analogous in two dimensions to a globe, the surface of the, the Earth. That's the surface of the Earth is a two-dimensional thing, but it's finite in size. Um, a flat plane is um, that's uh, infinite in extent, and a kind of saddle shape. Um, if you think about it, but going off in all directions would be a negatively curved space, but also infinite. And th those are two-dimensional analogies for the three-dimensional case. They're very hard to picture. That's the difficulty. Yes. Uh, you know, you can, you can do it all mathematically, and it kind of makes sense, but in your head, it's really hard to imagine. Let's have an easy one, then. Where Ooh. did God come from? Oh, yes. <laughs> now, you see, this, uh, this is... Um, I won't, I'm not criticizing anybody who asked it, but it is a bit of the Dawkins-type question. Um, uh, but um, God, if God is necessary, as, as, as philosophers talk about God, then that means that there never was when God was not. God always is. So there's no sense of God coming from anything. So, you see, Dawkins asked the question, you know, more pointedly, really, who created God then? Well, that question is to misunderstand the meaning of the word God. Anything that's created is not God. Now, you can argue about whether there is a necessary being, whether God exists. Uh, but if God exists, then he wasn't created. He created everything else. He's eternal. Um, so I hope that helps with that question. Yes, thank you. A similar one. Did God come into existence at the same time as the universe, or was he before? Is he the beginning, or was he before? If before, there was existence before, and therefore he exists within something, and he did not create it. But I think you said, if yeah, but I mean, the definition of God means he's a necessary being, he is not created. And well, that's, that's, that's yeah. right, but there is, there is also a slight confusion about, uh, uh, you know, a, a difficulty about meanings of words like before. Yeah. If time came into existence, if time started then, um, but of course in a, in a sort of classical view of God, then he's, he transcends time. He's, as it were, outside time. Now, a question about fine-tuning. Supposing that a century or two from now, a scientific explanation for fine-tuning is accepted, 
Will not God be pushed even further away? In other words, is your theistic explanation not a God of the gaps? Yeah, well, that again is a, is a good question. Um, and that's sometimes raised about um, God of the gaps. I mean, God of the gaps I, uh, uh, certainly applies, in my view, to um, the, the view that you, you'd call intelligent design, capital I, capital D, coming out of America, whereby certain um, creatures, certain um, organs, say, um, can't be explained by the normal processes of, of science by evolution. So they, they talk about the, um, the, the tail that wiggles a bacteria being so complex. But everything in biology is complex, and there are explanations for that. Now, when it comes to fine-tuning, what we're asking is not that kind of question, but why the laws of nature take the form they do in the first place. It's a sort of meta-scientific question. Why these particular laws with these particular features? Um, I, I, it's a different question. And it seems to me that that is a question that transcends the science. What science does is discover the laws and work out what the consequences of those laws are. Uh, but it can't explain why those particular laws are instantiated. And we can certainly imagine lots of different laws. And this kind of question, you might say, uh, had already been dealt with, say, by inflation, when it explained um, the, why, why the density takes the value it does. Now, there are a lot of problems with inflation and with that explanation, um, but suppose it had done. Well, the question hasn't gone away, because the question is then, okay, why, why does the theory of inflation apply that gives just the right answers? Why that theory that gives all the... Suppose it calculated... We had the theory of everything which calculated all the numbers correctly. Why does that theory apply would still be the, the question. The apparent and theoretical masses of the universe cannot be reconciled without the use of dark matter or dark energy. Mm -hmm. Does this mean that our current understanding or theories are inadequate? Well, they're certainly incomplete. That's what it means. Um, so um, you have, we know what, we understand what 5% of the universe is made of. That's ordinary matter. Um, now, there's also uh, something called dark matter. We, have, we don't know what it is. Now, with dark matter, we do, know, um, we do know that it's there, that something is there. Now, I was talking to a physicist, uh, the, 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 your, 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 one of your people, the lady who teaches physics. Um, and, and talking about, what, uh, about uh, planets being held in orbits. Now, it's a bit like that with galaxies. Um, the stars go around the centers of galaxies, and um, they're going too fast on the outer edges of galaxies to be compatible with the amount of matter that's in the galaxy. Uh, the galaxy should theoretically fly apart if, um, if there was only the matter you can measure. Um, the, the, the ordinary matter that you can measure in the stars and in the interstellar gas and so on. So you need more, more mass concentrated in these galaxies uh, to, to, to mean that the, the stars are kept in their orbit. So that, and that accounts for another 25%, uh, roughly, uh, of what's there, of, of, of the mass of the universe. And then the remaining mass is this mysterious 75%, which is labeled dark energy, which is also associated with um, Einstein's cosmological constant. Now, again, we don't know what that is. Um, if it's the energy of the quantum vacuum, then uh, our calculations to do with it are completely, completely, um, you know, well, they're hopeless uh, by an order of 10 to the 120, as I, I mentioned. Um, and I mentioned that Einstein introduced this constant uh, it wasn't needed in his equations, but he had it there because he wanted a universe that was static and eternal. When Lemaitre came up with his solutions, Einstein remarked that, well, your mathematics is very good, but your physics is hopeless. He didn't like the, like many scientists afterwards, like Hoyle, like Hawking, Einstein didn't initially like the idea that the universe was uh, had a finite beginning, 
Um, and he fixed the value of this cosmological constant to make it, to make it uh, eternal and static. Um, Lemaitre kept a cosmological constant in, and his initial model, he, had, he, he, he realized that Einstein's model was unstable and that it would eventually, eventually expand. And then later on, he found the, uh, the, the, what we now, what is basically the model we, we're working with, the expanding universe model, with a small cosmological constant. Is there any suggestion of how many planets in our own galaxy support life? No, that's again, I mean, these are great questions. Um, in our own galaxy, well, no. Now, there, uh, this is an area where there is fantastic observational work being done. Uh, Jennifer Wiseman, uh, Steve and I were talking about earlier on, she's been involved with this at NASA. Um, and there are people in Cambridge involved with this kind of search for extraterrestrial life. It involves the most finely judged uh, sort of measurements. You have distant stars with planets uh, going around them. And the two main ways of measuring how, um, what, what, but finding the planets in the first place. And the one is to see the planet going around its star and to measure the wobble in the star. Because when, the, when the, uh, the, the planet's in front, of course, the, the traction is just slightly towards it and then slightly away when it's the other side. So you get a wobble of the star. And then the other, the other method is just simply to look at the transit of the planet across the star's surface and to see a very tiny, tiny diminution of the light. And these are tiny, tiny effects. And we have measured them. And we found, of course, you have to rely on the plane of the orbit of the, the, the planet and the, and the star aligning with us, our ob observations on Earth. But they've discovered, oh, probably several thousand planets now, but most of them are uh, Jupiter-like large planets that are just pure gas. We've discovered now, oh, a, a handful, uh, maybe eight or ten or so, and we're discovering new ones all the time, but you know, a very small number that are in the so-called habitable zone. So they are, and, and they're, you know, maybe an Earth mass, maybe between one and ten Earth masses. Um, and they're in the, the right sort of region, right sort of orbit around the, the, the star. Now, that's a step. But it's a long way from, from finding, from actually finding life. You, know, you then have to search for what elements are there, or what uh, chemicals are there, is there water and all that sort of thing. And then whether there's, whether there's um, actually life, and then what form that life is. Is it just bacteria? Is it advanced intelligent life? And this has been a question that's been around now for quite a long time. And there was a guy called Frank Drake, now we're talking about 60 odd or more years ago, who wrote down an equation which calculated how many intelligent uh, life uh, civilizations there were in our galaxy. And he multiplied a long string of numbers together, a lot of probabilities. The number of uh, um, the rate of star formation, the number. The, the, the probability that given um, a star and a planet that life gets going, the probability that life get, 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 turns into, eventually evolves into intelligent life. And he put very optimistic numbers in and calculated, though, there were you know, uh, millions of civilizations in our, thousands or millions of our civilizations in our galaxy. But the problem is we don't know any of those numbers to any degree of accuracy. If any of them is really, really tiny, like the probability of life getting started in the first place, or the probability, once it has started, of it evolving into intelligent life. And Simon Conway Morris has thought about this, who you've, you've you, I don't know if you've had him speak, but you've certainly... Not yet. Um, uh, it, it reckons that these, these numbers could be very low. Um, and then they, and, and even if you have 10 to the 22 stars in the observable universe, if the probability of life getting going is one divided by 10 to the 50 or something, well, that, you know, it's often just assumed because there are that number of stars that there, there, there have to be, um, you know, other intelligent life forms. It's not the case. And just to, to, to finish on that particular topic, um, there was a, there's a guy called Enrico Fermi who um, worked at... Um, Los Alamos, he was working on the hydrogen bomb, 
at one lunchtime, as a sort of slight distraction from that, he speculated about life in the galaxy, and he uh, said, well, hang on, why aren't they here? We can do a few rough calculations. We're maybe only 100 or 200 years away from um, having the technology to, send, to colonize uh, pl planets around near, nearby stars. You know, just give, these, give civilizations a few hundred years to, get, get, you know, to develop and a few hundred years to get going and so on. You know, how long would it take to get between stellar systems uh, given... Uh, um, you know, technology that could, you know, rockets that can go maybe 10 to the speed of light and so on. You can do some rough calculations and you can find that, well, if there were lots of civilizations out there, the whole galaxy should have been colonized um, within an age, within millions of years, which is small in terms of the lifetime of the galaxy. So his question was, why aren't they here? And that remains quite a key I think quite a, quite a convincing argument as they're not being, certainly, uh, advanced civilizations in any, any numbers, if at all. Well, let's go to the beach. Are there more stars than grains of sand? Mm. <laughs> 10 to the 22 stars. A, a biologist or um, uh, so, someone else will have to tell me how many grains of sand there are. <laughs> One with... 22 noughts after it, maybe one with 24 noughts after its stars in the observable part of the universe. That's an awful lot. Uh, I suspect there could be more grains of sand. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'd have to... I think the most recent calculation I've seen, there are more stars, but I'll leave that to yeah, you. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know, because I, I just don't have a feel for grains of how many grains of sand there might be. There, there are, there are, there are There's a lot. a lot of them, aren't there, a on lot. the beach? Yes, right. There are a lot. <laughs> 10 to the 24 is, 10 to 22, 24 is a big number, though. Let's go to multiverses, then. Does the multiverse hypothesis uh, uh, require as much faith as a theistic model? Well, exactly. I think that is... My answer to that would be more, <laughs> actually. Yeah. It's highly, highly speculative. The problem is we can't ever... Um, in principle, observe other universes. Um, if they're regions within, a, a, within an overarching space, which is the main kind of model I've talked about, there are some models where, which is somewhat different from that, um, but the, the point is that the background space is expanding. You can't send a signal at faster than speed of light, but the space is expanding faster than that. So you, you can't, we can't receive signals from other universes. We can never physically know they're there. The other kind of um, way of getting multiverses is um, through quantum splitting of universes. Now, that all sounds very complicated, but basically, um, in quantum theory, the theory of the very small, when you make a measurement on something, the outcome is indeterministic. It's, you can calculate a probability that the outcome will be one way or the other. Um, now, what multiverse proponents or, or say, or some of them, and there's, this goes back to one person in particular, Hugh Everett, um, had an interpretation of quantum theory in which the universe split at that point, and all the possibilities occur, but in different universes. Now, in order to do, solve the fine-tuning, you have to add something to that, that when they split, somehow the physical constants change, which, then that's, a, that's completely separate from the, the, the basic theory. But anyway, that's another way of getting them. Now, what was the question? Um, does more faith. More yeah. faith in the multiverse. Yeah, you can't observe them. Right. You can't observe them, okay? And that even more so, that kind of one I've just, just described. Um, you can't observe them. Now, the only way you can get a handle on them is by asking the question, well, what should we expect to observe in this universe that might give an indication that there are other universes? Well, we, we, could, we could just about, if our universe was finite, as I explained a few minutes ago, decide that the universe was finite. You know, there isn't an infinite space. If it is infinite, we can't measure the overall density of, a, of, a, of an infinite universe, so we can't know. But what would we expect to observe here? And then that's when, then when this argument of Penrose kicks in. 
that we would expect to see a universe that is just ordered enough, just a sufficient structure enough for us to be here and to subsist and survive as observers of the universe. And that is a very, very, very tiny fraction of the universes that would have life in them. Um, that's the monkey sitting at the typewriter and coming up with to be or not to be when actually we're living in a universe that's comparable with the complete works of Shakespeare. A couple of theological ones. Does the theologian suggest that there are or have been or will be Christ figures wherever there is life? Well, that, again, is a very good question. That's the key question when it comes to whether there is intelligent life elsewhere on this planet. And, um, and, and actually, that has been thought about for a very long time in uh, Christian history. Paul Davis says it's a defeater for Christianity because, you know, uh, Christ only saves humans. Um, but I think that's, that's false. Christ, uh, you know, redeems, I mean, the, the cosmos is redeemed. But, um, and, and of course, there are different, there, some people give different answers to this question. There's a, a theologian in Cambridge called Brian Hebblethwaite who thinks that um, God cannot become incarnate as another, uh, cre as, a, as another intelligent creature somewhere else. That is somehow self-contradictory. There are other theologians, John Polkinghorne, who's very big in the science theology area, he thinks, well, if little green Martians needed saving, then God would become a little green Martian if they are you know, fallen creatures and so on. And then there would be the other issue, even if they weren't fallen in the sense that they'd sinned and needed redemption, it would be pretty puzzling that we were uniquely privileged in... Um, having God reveal himself to us as one of us, and they hadn't. Um, so that would be, um, that would be uh, an argument in favor of God becoming incarnate in other forms. Uh, the theologian E.L. Maskell in the 1950s thought about this a lot and thought that it was entirely compatible with, um, the, if, if you're familiar with theology, with what was decided about the person of Christ at the Council of Chalcedon, the one person in two natures, that it would be conceivable for that person, Christ, the, the, the word of God, to take on another intelligent form. Not two humans, couldn't be two humans, but it could be. Sure. Uh, apart from a creation event, nothing in the Bible matches the universe we now see. So why is God the Christian God and not, say, the Hindu gods, Egyptian gods, or Norse gods, etc.? Well, yes. Now, um, it, it seems to me, um, of course, I mean, the, the cosmology of the Bible is actually um, is primitive cosmology. They didn't know about the Big Bang. They didn't know about the size of the universe. They wondered about the universe. Well, um, when I look at your heavens, the moon, and the stars, what, is, what are human beings that you're mindful of them and the son of man that you visit him and so on? Um, so they, they saw a vastness, and Abraham looked at the stars and, and, and so on. Um, uh, and God is the creator of all that there is, biblically. Um, there's no doubt about that, and that's what the, all the stories of creation are telling us, the Genesis chapter 1 and so on. So God is creator, God is unique, there are no, no other gods. Um, and it seems to me that... Um, Monotheism makes a whole heap more sense than, than polytheism, there being lots of gods. Going back to Occam's razor, it's the simplest theory. Why 326 gods or some random number of gods? One god is simpler, one necessary being. But of course, as we say in Trinitarian terms, it's subsisting as three persons in the one god. Um, that is a much simpler. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, the, the, the whole question of incarnation makes total sense the, when we come to the New Testament, that God takes human flesh, comes among us, and I think the evidence, the, the, the actual 
historical evidence for the life, death, and resurrection of Christ is highly, highly persuasive, uh, particularly and in very supremely importantly for the resurrection. Now, in Hindu mythology, you get dying and rising gods, you get things in Greek myth and so on. Um, but as C.S. Lewis very interestingly said, these are all kind of hints, if you like, of or, or, or um, predilections in some way of the one unique historical incarnation, death, and resurrection of the one true God. And that's how I, where I'd stand on it. Thank you. Last one then. How does your argument lead to the conclusion of a God of classical theism with properties such as omnibenevolence? Does it not simply lead to the existence of a transcendent being? So is yeah. Where do you get to God? Yeah, well, that's, that, I mean, that's a, very, a very good point. I mean, this argument only gets you so far. And, and I wouldn't say that it leads to the God I've just... Well, God, as I understand God fully, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, it gets you to God, the Creator. I think it's a powerful argument for God, for there to, to be God uh, as necessary being behind the universe... Hoyle's superintellect, it got him as far as a superintellect, purely from looking at science. But to go on beyond that, that's when you need the script, scripture and the revelation of God in scripture and in the person of Christ, God's self-revelation of himself in Christ. And so, so for me, doing this, what I call natural theology is simply a preparation for doing uh, Systematic theology, um, theology of Revelation. Rodney, thank you. The Book of God's Word and the Book of God's Works, both required. Thank you very much indeed. Rodney, thank you very much for answering our questions. Sorry, we haven't got through every single one, but thank you for all that variety of questions. Um, some of us have come to more than one of these uh, gatherings, so thank you to everyone who's come either tonight or for the whole range of talks. Thank you so much for supporting the series. We do hope it might be possible to establish an annual Science and Faith talk in Farringdon, so please look out for further information in due course. And if you'd like to see some of the previous talks, uh, we are putting them on, or perhaps recommend them to uh, a friend. We're putting them on our website, All Saints Farringdon website. The first two talks are already up. The third one's about to go. This one will be edited and put on as well, so you can see it. And thanks to our videographer, Steve Pierce, for his hard work in doing that for us. Um, you've had a feedback form for this evening. It would really help us enormously if you wouldn't mind just filling that in, popping it in the box at the back before you go. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone who's helped in any way towards this series and this evening, uh, especially the planning team, that's Helen Wilson and Keith Thrower and Mark Ritchie, and the hosting team who've been on duty uh, tonight and on other evenings. And can we close by once again warmly thanking our speaker tonight, Rodney Holder. Thanks, Rodney. <laughs>